We've reached the mountaintop of Romans. We're about to finish chapter 8. Can you believe it? Halfway through the book. And then we will take a little bit of a break. How about we don't do Romans for the rest of the year? And then we'll restart in January. How about that? Let's pray. I certainly need your prayers as I'm up here too, so please do. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for your, your love and your grace towards us. We know that um, you're working in our hearts and lives. We trust that, um, yeah, we're thankful that you got the power back on, and that you got here, everyone here safely. And we do pray that as we do walk through this pretty incredible passage, that um, you would keep the enemy away, that you would help us to understand what's being said here, and that those of us who are struggling with assurance of salvation, with your love, with our own sin, I pray that you would encourage us here this morning by this incredible passage. Give me air in my lungs, give me strength in my body, help me to do what you call me to do, in Jesus' name, amen. And so, this section of Romans 8 is so powerful that if you could commit it to memory, I think it could change your life. I really do. This is an incredible passage that shows us that salvation is all God's idea. He's the one who accomplishes it from beginning to end. And really, by the end of this passage, I think it becomes very clear that we are secure uh, in our salvation as well. As we've been saying, though, it's important to think through the context of what we've been talking about, because really, he's, he's still talking about the sufferings of this present time. It's interesting, we, we, we talk all about this, you know, not being separated from the love of Christ, but in 8, verse 36 and 37, which Steve just read, it says this, right in the middle of this encouraging section, it says, for your sake, we are killed all day long, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. It seems odd to say in the middle of a section all about his love for us and us never losing that love, and yet I think that helps us to understand the context of why he's sharing that with this, uh, with this audience, because this is an audience of people living in Rome who are or who will someday um, suffer for their faith and likely even die for their faith. And so these believers needed to know that in a world that condemned them to misery and to death, that they would never lose the love of God. That, that no matter what happened in their lives, the world hates them, the minions of hell rage against them, nothing could ever separate them from the love of Christ. They had to be reminded of that. And so that's, that, that's pretty cool, and it's also true for us. And so let's talk about the golden, golden chain of salvation now. Really, it's pretty cool what he has to say here. You can study this one for a long, long time. Here's what he says. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Here's the, here's the golden chain now. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. It's very interesting. In verse 28, I think we covered this last week, he says, all things work together for good to those who love God. Well, again, this isn't saying that God will never allow anything bad to happen in our lives. That's obviously not true, right? But what it does mean is that God is so totally in control of everything that comes our way and everything that happens to us that he is able to use all things, even the most evil or horrible of things, for our ultimate good and for his glory, which is pretty crazy to think about when we think about some of the terrible things that can happen in life. And then he goes on to share what we've called here the golden chain of salvation, from God's foreknowledge to glorification. It shares this, this unbreakable chain that shows just how remarkable God's plan of salvation is. He starts it, he finishes it. From beginning to end, salvation really is of the Lord. So pretty cool. And if even one of these is true of you, all the rest is true too. It's all one big package deal. So let's talk about it here together, because there is a little bit of maybe disagreement on some of these words. Let me give you Kevin's opinion on what I think is going on. First, he says, whom he foreknew. So God's chain of salvation for you and for me begins with God's foreknowledge. Well, what does the word foreknow mean? Well, it's simply, as far as I know in Scripture, it means to know something before it happens. Interesting. Where else is this word found in the Bible? For you note-takers, 2 Peter 3.17 uses the same word. This is what it says. 
This helps us to understand where this word is used and how it's used. So in 2 Peter, he's been warning them about false teachers. They're coming, beware. And then he finishes the, the, the book by saying this. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, know what beforehand? That false teachers are coming. Beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away, from the, uh, away with the error of the wicked. And so that phrase, since you know this beforehand, the exact same word as Romans 8 that says, for new, for new. And so it's very interesting. Your salvation begins with God having knowledge about something before it ever happened. Very interesting. And as well, you notice in verse 29, it, it says, whom he foreknew, not what. So it isn't necessarily a person's actions that he is seeing. It is a person whom he knows before they ever existed. Anyone's brain blown yet? Very interesting. Very interesting. And so here's a question. What does God see in a person that causes him to choose them and to save, and to save them? The passage doesn't say. We know certainly it's not our goodness, righteousness, or worthiness. God doesn't look throughout all of human history before time began and say, man, what a great guy. I want him on my team. No, I don't think that's what's going on because we're all sinful and no one deserves to go to heaven. Here's my opinion. What did God foreknow about the people that he ended up saving? Some believe that God saw their faith in Christ. He looked ahead, if you could say it that way, this person's going to believe. Either way, it doesn't say, but this salvation chain begins with God's foreknowledge. God knew you before you were ever born, and that's where your salvation began. Very interesting. There's some disagreement about that word, but we won't go there right now. He also predestined. Now, this is a packed word full of a lot of debate, isn't it? And the church has been debating predestination for 2,000 years, and guess what? We're not going to solve it here today, amen? Right, my Calvinist friends? Right, my, right, my Arminian friends? We are not going to solve this uh, this word here today. Well, those of the Calvinist or Reformed persuasion, which I'm not, generally speaking, at least not totally, they would say something like this, and I disagree with this, but I'll read what they would say. R.C. Sproul said this, what predestination means in its most elementary form is that our final destination, either heaven or hell, is decided by God, not only before we get there, but before we are even born. Okay? George Bryson said, you will be saved or damned for all eternity because you were saved or damned from all eternity. So the Calvinist view of predestination is God has selected whether you're going to heaven or hell before you even existed. That is, what, that is also how many would interpret this passage. So here's the question. Does this word translated predestined, and we'll get to that in a second, it could actually be translated different ways. Does that mean <clears throat> that all of my life including my eternal future, either in heaven or in hell, has already been decided long before I was even born. That my destiny is already set, and there's nothing I can do to change it. And if that's true, why bother doing anything? Now, even if this is the case, that this is what the word means, keep in mind the word foreknew is used before the word predestination, that God knows something before it happens. And so this order of foreknowledge followed by predestination actually is all over the New Testament, and it's always in that order, especially regarding salvation. 1 Peter 1 verse 2 says this. He's addressing to these Christians, and he calls them this. He calls them the elect, so that's who, whom God has chosen, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. So what is God's selection of you based off of? His foreknowledge. What did he know before time began? I don't know, it doesn't say. But he knew something. So even if God has set your destiny to heaven or to hell before time, to, time began, which is very possible, I guess, that choice to save or to damn is based on his foreknowledge. I don't know exactly what he knew, but apparently he knew something. This is what I believe. One thing is for sure. I don't believe our salvation is arbitrary or random. I do not believe people are randomly chosen to be saved or randomly chosen to be condemned. 
There seems to be, at least from Scripture, you go to the book of John, it's used 60 times. You go to the book of Romans, it's used over 50 times. This word faith or believe, it seems to be that the key difference, at least from our perspective, between those who are saved and those who are not is what? Faith in Jesus. And so maybe you're thinking, man, how do I know I'm one of the elect? Is your faith in Jesus? Well, yes, it is. Well, guess what? You're one of the elect. Amen? It's really that simple. What did I read in Ephesians last year? And there was a quote from a guy. What did he say? He basically said, I think we debate some things that God really hasn't really revealed to us. And maybe it's a little silly to do so. Now, this word predestined is interesting. It can actually be translated different ways. And we're going a little deep here, but it is what it is. It can be translated in different ways. Let me read some other uh, translations, which might open up the meaning here to us. It could also be translated previously appointed. Previously appointed. So it really has the idea of God having a plan, but not setting our destiny. That really changes the meaning. Predestined can also be translated marked off as his own. Interesting. It could also be translated lay claim to. So God knows something about us, and since he does, he comes and lays claim to us. The word can mean that. Classic scholar Arthur Way translates the passage this way. Here's how, he translate, here's how he translates it. Long ere this he knew our hearts. That's the foreknowledge. Long ere this he claimed us as those whom he should mold into the very likeness of his own son. I personally think this is very encouraging. I don't really get upset about the, you know, the difference between predestination or all these things. I'm encouraged that God saw I would believe and now he adopts me as his own before time began. I think that's pretty cool. I don't think this passage is telling me who will believe and who won't or why. It is not saying we are predestinated to faith. It is telling us actually that we're predestined to glory, which, which we'll get to in a minute. And so I know my Calvinist friends will have a good debate after this. But I do think this is what it's saying. In fact, the predestination here <clears throat> may not actually be related to who God picks, it might actually be that Christians are predestined to glory, which is actually a a passage on eternal security. So, very interesting. Let me read what what one author says, and then we'll move on. And it's, again, we're not going to settle this here today. (laughs) But it's a fun one. Wait till we get to chapter 9. You may not not like what I have to say. Uh, Let's see. Here's what one guy said. I think this is helpful. He said this, To foreknow and to predestine are not the same thing. One is an act of foreknowledge, or knowing something before it occurs. The other is to decree something. We only have knowledge of the past, but God foresees the future even as he sees the past. He foresees it not because he's decreed it, because there are no limitations on his knowledge. Augustine said there can be no predestination without foreknowledge, but there can be foreknowledge without predestination. Interesting. Whom does God foreknow? In this author's opinion, those who shall love God. As he looked into the future, these were present to his mind or foreknown. What did he predestine of them? Not that they should love God, not that they should believe, not that some should be saved and others damned, but that those whom he saw beforehand who would love God would be conformed to the image of his Son. Very, very interesting. Notice here, he predestines us actually to the conformity to the image of Christ in verse 29. What does he mean by the image of Christ? It means his moral character. So every believer in Jesus has been pre-appointed to become like Jesus, not just in the final resurrection, but in our lives progressively day by day here and now. In fact, in verse 28, it talks about God working out the good in our lives. The good of Romans 8, 28 really has much more to do with me becoming more like Jesus than it is everything in my life working out the way I want it to. Okay? One author said this about the conformity to the image of Christ. This is the burden of the whole gospel. Where the gospel does not do this for a person, it does nothing of any lasting value. Where it does this, it does everything. Are we like Christ? That is the testing question. We'll talk more about that next week. You guys still with me? Complicated stuff. Verse 30, he says, okay, he knew us. He predestined us or marked us out or laid claim to us to be like Jesus Christ. Then he, in verse 30, it says, he calls us. 
He calls us. Now, it's interesting. There is a general gospel call that goes out. You've shared Jesus with a friend. Maybe they believe, maybe they didn't. Many, some believe, many don't. But in this passage, those who are called by God here are those who definitely believe. And here's the interesting thing. You, you, you who are a Christian here in this building, did you find God or did God find you? Who here thinks that you found God? There's no wrong answer here. Who here thinks that God found you? Okay. What do, we, what do we read in Romans 3? There is no one who seeks out God. No, not one. And so if anyone here in this room is saved, it's because God called you and God saved you. Now, why we responded and others don't, I don't know. And I don't think the Bible necessarily teaches us that. I think people are held responsible for what they choose to believe. But this passage is clear that who God knew and who he laid claim to, he calls, and apparently they all respond, those whom he knew. Very interesting. Okay, now, justified. When we respond to the call of God, he calls us to himself. The Bible says that we are justified. We learned all about this in chapter 3, right? We believe in Jesus. God imputes us, he imputes us as righteous. We now have right standing with God. We talked about that for a couple weeks. And finally, he says glorified. So starting all the way back before time began, God knew us, he laid claim to us. Now in our life, he calls us, he justifies us, and now he glorifies us. Of course, being glorified has to do with heaven, having a new body, being resurrected. If your Bible is open, you'll notice there is a past tense here. It doesn't say those whom he justified, he will eventually glorify. He uses the past tense. He has glorified, he will glorify. And so this golden chain of salvation is so solid, so sure, so secure that if we trust in Jesus and are justified, we are already glorified in his eyes. And we see this all throughout Scripture. In the book of, of Ephesians, for example, it says that we are seated in the heavenly places with Christ. I don't know about you, but I'm standing right here. And yet it says that of me. In Colossians, it says that I am hidden with Christ in God. Feels like I'm standing right here. And yet scripture uses these truths, present tense, not that we're currently glorified, but it is so sure that we, will de that we will be. And some believe, again, like I said, that this predestination might actually be for the Christian to glory, which would change the meaning a little bit. Unbreakable set of truths this is. This should give us confidence in our salvation. If you have trusted in Jesus... It's not because you found him. It's not because you figured it out. It's because long before time began, long before you were ever born, for some reason, God chose you. Very interesting. <laughs> if you have more questions than answers, that's okay. So do I. Man, this is now a very encouraging passage. Let's read it. What then shall we say to these things, everything he said in the book of Romans so far, so far if God is for us, who can be against us? Good question. <clears throat> he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword, which is what these believers were going through? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Pretty cool. One author said this, this whole passage strikes all thoughtful interpreters and readers as transcending almost everything in language. And so I can't do this passage any justice because this is so high, so amazing, so mighty. We are on the mountaintop. The air's a bit thin, folks. <laughs> but it's incredible, incredible truth. He really asks a set of questions here, and, and they're questions with obvious answers. Most of the answers are nothing or no one. So here's the first question. If God is for us, who can be against us? This is pretty incredible because there was a time in your life, there was a time, in fact, even in the book of Romans, where God was against you in his wrath. And yet, because of what Jesus has done for us, 
the Bible makes this very bold statement saying God is now for us. Now, does this mean that God sides with us when we sin or when we're wrong or that God is some sort of a yes man who approves of all the sinful things that we do? No, not at all. But what it does mean is that God is working on our behalf, that he is with us and on our side even when things are falling apart all around us. And so if it's true that God is for us, who can be against us? Well, the answer is no one and and sometimes everyone. And yet, if we were to take the entire God-hating world along with all the demons of hell on one side, on this side of the scale, and God on the other, if God is really for us, even if all else is against us, and sometimes it is, it doesn't matter. Our side wins every single time. Amen? He's for us. He's for us. Though the world mocks us and the minions of hell rage against us, God is for us. What could possibly matter if that is true? Psalm 118, verse 6 says this, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what man can do unto me. Some of us are too darn worried about what people think of us. God is for us. Who cares what they think? One author said this, Sin is under our feet, and heaven is over our heads. What then have we to fear? Good question. The challenge I think we have with this question is, do we really believe it? I think we look in the mirror and we, we think, wow. There's no way God is for me. Newell said this, Are weak hearts prone to legalism and unbelief? Boy, is that true. Receive these words with great difficulty. God is for us, and yet we failed him. God is for us, and yet we're ignorant. God is for us, and yet we haven't brought forth much fruit, and yet he's for us. Isn't that true? Verse 32, he asks this question, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Right? And so he's already given us his son. He's already given us the greatest thing. Why wouldn't he give us everything else? This doesn't mean health, wealth, and prosperity, but it very much has to do with being an heir of God, being a co-heir with Christ, that great reward that is, that is waiting for us. God's not going to withhold anything we need. He's already given us the greatest thing. Amen? Verse 33, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. And so the world can say whatever it wants about you. The enemy can accuse you of all sorts of things. And if you're a Christian, you're going to have non-Christians accuse you of things that aren't true, actually. And even your own conscience can condemn you. But the only one that can truly bring any charges against you is who? God. And yet he's the one who justifies us. What does that mean? Our sin will never be held against us in any sort of way. The only one who can charge a sin against us has justified us. That's pretty cool. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. One author said this, The passage implies that there would be a high degree of absurdity in supposing that the same being would both justify and condemn the same individual. The Christian, therefore, is secure. Or maybe we can say this, shall Christ who has died condemn them? So he saved you by his blood. He's now going to condemn you. Again, the world, the flesh, and the devil can condemn us as much as it wants. And there is certainly sin in our lives still as believers. What what we're told here is that the only one who is able to condemn is at the right hand of God making intercession for us. So Jesus actually has no time to condemn you. Why? He's constantly interceding for you. And what does that imply, by the way, that we still sin? Because he's, he's, he's auto-cleansing us, if you, as it were. Pretty cool. No, he, can't, he won't condemn us because he's interceding for us. All of our sin is covered. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? He mentions here tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword as things that can never separate us from the love of Christ. That even though we may experience all these things in life, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Again, this matches the context of suffering believers who need encouragement, right? Because it's in those moments of suffering, our body is racked with pain, somebody's died, we've lost a friend, we've been hurt in the church, whatever it is, that we begin to doubt God's love for us, don't we? We begin to doubt... Is any of this even true? So he's trying to encourage these believers. No, no matter what happens, you will never be separated from the love of God. 
Pretty cool. For I am persuaded I think he basically names everything possible here other than God. And we've already shown God won't, do, won't, God won't condemn us as believers. For I am persuaded that, ne- that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, the demons, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So this is the capstone of the book of Romans, because here's the thing. You and I are sinners by nature. We were, if you're a believer, horribly lost and dead in our sins and trespasses, right? We learn all about these things in the book of Romans. In chapter 1, we learned that we all know God is real, but we suppress the truth because we want to live in sin. We learned in chapter 2, we love to judge others who are worse off than us while ignoring the very real sins in our own hearts and lives. And so I and you deserve to die, and we deserve to go to hell for all of eternity. And yet Romans chapter 5 told us, God in his great love, while I was still an ungodly sinner, became a man and died in my place. And so if that is true, if God has done all of that to purchase me with his own life's blood, what can ever separate me from his love? And the answer is nothing and no one, not even me. And so I can't jump out of his hand. Pretty cool. Here's the thing. God knew every sin that I would or could ever commit. He knows what I am and how bad I could be. And yet, he died for me anyway. And so not a single thing in all of creation, angels, demons, my circumstances, my sin, the choices of other people, my own choices, or any other thing. He says any other created thing. Here's a question. (laughs) What in the universe has been created by God? Everything. What is the only thing in the in existence that is uncreated? God. Nothing can separate us from his love. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Now the same cannot be said for those who die without Christ. There will be a time, if you're not a believer, that you will be separated from the love of Christ. You get it now. The offer of salvation is available for you now. There will be a day where that love and that grace will be withdrawn. One author said this, and then we will uh, celebrate communion together. Here's what he said. For how would it be a source of consolation to them that whom, to say that whom God foreknew he predestined, and whom he predestined he called, and whom he called he justified, and whom he justified might fall away and be lost forever? Would that be encouraging? I don't think it would be. Man, so we just got through eight chapters of Romans. Is that cool or what? You want to keep going? Eight more chapters? Okay. Man, God's love can change our lives. That is what's going to change us. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we, uh, we think of this passage and the fact that we really can't do it any justice. There's so much that could be said here, that is said here. It really does in many ways transcend a human language. And yet, we have it in our Bible. Isn't that cool? I pray for each person here, Lord, as we each wrestle through the Christian life, as we think through different things that we've had to walk through this past week, in the past two years even, and it's been easy at times to doubt your love, to look at the world that's gone insane and to wonder where you are, to look at people we've been praying for and sharing with for years, even decades, and seeing no response. What a challenge it is. And yet, God, you are still on the throne. You are still sovereign over all things. There are still people in our community, in our congregation, whom you foreknew and who you will lay claim to. So we pray that you would continue to call and to draw people to yourself. We don't know how all of that pieces together, but we know what our job is. And so, Lord, I want to do those things for you as if it depends on me, but knowing full well that it's all you. So, Father, as we get into communion now, we ask that you would give us the grace we need to get right with you, to get right with each other. We take this time very seriously, that we would understand that um, this is a somber time. It is a time of celebration and remembrance, but it's also a time of reflection. 
So I pray that you would give us the strength we need to be able to do this this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Indulge me. Open up my commentary here. And uh, since we just kind of got halfway through the book, and it's such an exciting thing, I guess, it's, uh, I wanted to read you the lyrics from an old hymn. And it's just so powerful, and you may not catch everything I say, but if uh, you hear some of it, I think it will be encouraging. So this will be our benediction, then we'll be dismissed. And I can't sing it because I don't know what the tune is, and I'm not going to sing anyway. But it's called My High Tower by uh, by Paul Gerhardt, um, and it was written in 1676. It's all about what we've been learning in Romans, so here it is, okay? Is God for me? I fear not, though all against me rise. I call on Christ my Savior, the host of evil flies, my friend, the Lord Almighty, and he who loves me, God, what enemy shall harm me, though coming as a flood? I know it, I believe it, I say it fearlessly, that God the highest, mightiest, forever loveth me. At all times and all places he standeth at my side, he rules the battle fury, the tempest, and the tide." A rock that stands forever is Christ my righteousness, and there I stand unfearing in everlasting bliss. No earthly thing is needful to this my life from heaven, and naught of love is worthy, save that which Christ hath given. Christ all my praise and glory, my light most sweet and fair. The ship wherein he saileth is scatheless everywhere. In him I dare be joyful, a hero in the war. The judgment of the sinner affrighteth me no more. You can tell it was written in the 1600s. Very cool. There is no condemnation. There is no hell for me. The torment and the fire mine eyes shall never see. For me there is no sentence. For me death has no sting. Because the Lord who saved me shall shield me with his wings. Above my soul's dark waters, his spirit hovers still. He guards me from all sorrow, from terror, and from ill. In me he works and blesses the life seed he hath sown. From him I learn the Abba, that prayer of faith alone. And if in lonely places a fearful child I shrink, he prays the prayers within me I cannot ask or think. In deep unspoken language known only to that love, who fathoms the heart's mystery from the throne of light above. His spirit to my spirit, sweet words of comfort saith, how God the weak one strengthens who leans on him in faith, how he hath built a city of love and light and song, where the eye at last beholdeth what the heart had loved so long. And there is mine inheritance, my kingly palace home. The leaf may fall and perish, not lest the spring will come. As wind and rain of winter are earthly sighs and tears, till the golden summer dawneth of the endless year of years. The world may pass and perish, thou God wilt not remove. No hatred of all devils can part me from thy love. No hungering, nor thirsting, no poverty, nor care. No wrath of mighty princes can reach my shelter there. No angel and no heaven, no throne, no, nor power, nor might. No love, no tribulation, no danger, fear, nor fight. No height, no depth, no creature that has been or can be can drive me from thy bosom, can sever me from thee. My heart in joy upleapeth, grief cannot linger there, while singing high in glory amidst the sunshine fair. The source of all my singing is high in heaven above. The sun that shines upon me is Jesus and his love. We are dismissed.